the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Perhaps as I read the Epistle and Gospel for this evening, um, some of you might have difficulty finding it in your missile. If you have some of the older missiles, or if, some, if you have a newer missile, but it's a, an older missile reprinted, um, it won't have the mass that was approved by Pope Pius XI when he gave us the dogma of the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary in 1950. So if your missile is older than 1950, then more than likely you do not have the mass that was approved from that point on, which is the Epistle and Gospel that I read um, for today. When that happened, that event took place in 1950, when Pope Pius XII proclaimed that Mary truly was assumed into heaven. It was no longer a pious idea or a point of tradition only, but now it became a dogma of our faith. And that's the interesting thing about it, and that's what I'd like to develop some thoughts regarding this, about what it means by for our dogma of our faith, what it all means, and then, on top of all that, just how we arrived at this point, that this fact of Mary having been assumed into heaven, body and soul, is now in heaven, body and soul. It's a fact. It's not an opinion. It's not a nice idea. It's a fact. And how we got to that particular point with it, to the point that it is a necessary dogma of our faith, just like the 12 points of the Apostles' Creed that we pray at Mass, or when you pray the Rosary. I believe in one God. I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe in the Holy Ghost. I believe in the Catholic Church. I believe in the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary. We're here to give the same acknowledgement of faith to that dogma of our faith, as we do to all these other ones. It's very necessary for us as Catholics ever since 1950, when the Pope defined, that's the word they use, defined this dogma of our faith, and that we take it as an established fact. Now, for centuries, Catholics had always be- already believed that. So, how it would became necessary for the Pope to raise it to the level of a dogma, that's the interesting part. You see, our proof for the assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary rests not solely on points of reason, like we can reason to the existence of God, and then God has revealed himself to us, so we find that. The scriptures tell us that there is an existence of God, and so that's why we come to that, and all the other things that are in the Apostles' Creed. But not so with this dogma of the assumption of Mary. There's an interesting parallel, you know, in when the 1950 Mass was established, the epistle now became that from the book of Judith. There are many women of the Old Testament that are considered as types of the Blessed Virgin Mary because their lives. They gave people by the virtues of these holy women what we would see in virtues of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And what's admired in Judith, if you remember the story of Judith, that the little town of Bethulia was being besieged by Holofernes and this huge army. And it looked like they were going to fall at that particular point. And and Judith was the widowed uh, princess or queen. I can't remember. She was at least the princess. She might be like queen of Bethulia. And so the people turned to her and asked what we would do. And she just said, you know, asked for prayers and sacrifices for her. And she just put on her best of garments and walked right out the gate and right into the army of Paul of Paranus, which surprised the heck out of Philistines there, because here comes this Jewish woman just walking on on into the camp here with no fear. And so, because of that, I mean, don't go for the entire story because it's a long one, but basically, because of that, they started to celebrate, and this was going to be a proof to them that Bethulia would fall, because one of their people escaped and came here, so they had this huge party, and they all got drunk. Except for Judith. She woke up in the middle of the night, prayed and asked for help from God, took the sword of Holofernes and cut his head off. And it didn't stop there. She took the head of Holofernes on that sword back to Bethulia, went into the gates of Bethulia and hung the head of Holofernes on the top of the gateposts. So that when the Philistines woke up the next morning, all trying to get over their hangovers from being drunk, what they saw was the king. First they thought he was just sleeping. And they realized he's not just sleeping. We're making noise and he's not waking up. They went over to him and found out he didn't have his head. 
And so they started, you know, running around and being scared at that particular point. One of them pointed to the gateposts of Bethulia. There it is. He has been slaughtered in the middle of the night when they ran. And so the, the, the epistle for tonight is the praise given to Judith because she was there for the cutting off of the head of our enemy. It's going to be a typification how the Blessed Virgin Mary, in her role by God, is to cut off the head of the ancient serpent, the devil. We're going to read that in the offertory. If you have this Mass, 1950, you'll read it for the offertory. It comes from Genesis. I will put enmities between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. We celebrate the strength of the Blessed Virgin Mary to the point that she, death could not even conquer her. The devil could have no place with her in any particular way. She was taken right up into heaven. But all that, but, but that reference from the book of Judith is only what is called a typification. It's not an actual reference to Mary. Protestants can't, we can't point it to the Protestants. The book of Judith tells us that Mary was powerful and assumed into heaven. No, it doesn't say that. But it gives us what we honor in Mary, that strength that she has over the devil. So we can't really find in scriptures this whole dogma of the Assumption. And that bothers the Protestants and some modern Catholics attached to the modern church who themselves have bought into the whole scripture-only theory. And said, I can't believe in it because it's not in the scriptures. Well, as Catholics we know, the truths of our faith are based on two points. What is in the scriptures and what's also in tradition. And tradition we hold up to be just as sacred just as holy to us, just as firm in our belief as anything we find in the scriptures, and the scriptures interpreted according to as the church presents them to us, because it's a Catholic church only that is guided by the Holy Ghost. So we put together for our beliefs those two points, scripture, tradition. And if it's found in one of those, it doesn't have to be found in both, if it's found in one of those and protected and guarded and taught that way by the church, then we know we know at that point we can believe it safely because the church, guided by the Holy Ghost, presents it to us. So let's look at this real quickly, this tradition, how it got started for this dogma of the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary. It starts, like I said, with the offertory prayer for tonight. The devil is told that a woman would come. He's already tempted Eve and she goes to Adam. They both fail. They are removed from the Garden of Paradise. If a snake could smile and snicker, he did. But that's when God was standing next to him. And just, and, 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 and some pictures have it where the, the devil has a snake that's kind of like hanging out of a tree with his head down here with almost like a happy face on him. And God is standing right next to him and he said, it starts to warn you. I will put enmities between you, thee, and the woman. Between her seed, which will be Christ, and thy seed, called the children of the devil. She shall crush your head and you'll lie in wait for her heel. So there's the first promise, the first idea, and we apply this in so many different ways in tradition to our Blessed Mother, her Immaculate Conception, and so many other points in which we have devotion to her. But the prerogative, the reason why she could be assumed into heaven as to, and does not suffer the common fate of all of us to die and our bodies to corrupt in the grave starts here in this promise. Going on through the Old, the Old Testament, there's one time when Elias is there in his cave. He's the first founder in the Old Testament time, but he becomes the, the founding principles of that behind the, the Carmelites. Anyway, one time his cave is facing the ocean, the Mediterranean Sea, and he's out facing the water and sees clouds coming in from across the waters toward him. And there's one cloud that is shaped exactly like a foot. And he's given to understand that that Cloud represents she who was to be born, who will crush the serpent's head. And so Elias started a devotion to that woman. So devotion to Mary goes way back in Old Testament times. There's a miracle that surrounds the birth of Anna and Joachim to this young child, because they are an old couple, and they've never had children. But an angel appears, tells them they will, and they believe what the angel says. So even her old age, Anna, tomorrow we feast, celebrate the Feast of St. Joachim, but St. Anne um, gives birth to Mary. And then she gives herself over to God in the temple. 
And then we, you know, then we read, you know, the, the, the mystery of the Assumption, how the angel comes and invites her to be the mother of God. And then what's in the Gospel for today, Mary hears that her cousin Elizabeth is with child, so she, or the charity of her, her love for God, and for anyone else in need, she leaves. She goes, doesn't care about herself, leaves right away to take care of her cousin Elizabeth. And Elizabeth salutes her and the child that is in her. And then Mary speaks forth. We call the prayer the Magnificat. And among those things, she says of it, she says, He who was mighty hath done great things to me. And behold, from henceforth, all generations will call me blessed. So even though we have those words in scriptures, they don't specifically point to the fact that Mary was conceived without sin, that she's a, a, a great devotion to us, or that she was assumed into heaven, body, and soul. However, it does teach us by this inspiration of the Holy Ghost that she is saying that God has done great things in her, and he who is mighty has done these things, and that she will be praised from generation to generation because of this great work that God has wrought within her. Moving away from the scriptures, going back to the point of tradition, there's a church in Jerusalem, pretty much the center of the city, and it's run now by the Benedictines. And it's one of the oldest churches in Jerusalem, apart from the cathedral there, you know, the, uh, the, the Holy Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And it was built over the spot that tradition says where Mary had her dormition. Dormo means to sleep, like dormitory. Dormo means to fall asleep. The tradition regarding all this is that Mary didn't die like we did with all the pains and sufferings and worries and all these type of things. She knows she was going to go see her son. She didn't have worries about sin in her soul, that disturbance and all those particular things. It was the common lot that all would die. The son of Mary died on the cross. So she too would die, but not in the same manner. That's why, you know, as faithful as she had been to God, he had protected her from that corruption of the grave. This is part of the dogma that's in the encyclical by Pope Pius XI. So this is called the Church of the Dormition. And it's a wonderful spot. It looks almost like a casket right there that you can see where Mary died centuries ago. But it isn't a casket because there's no body there. The body has been assumed into heaven. And for all these centuries, they've kept this spot faithful, knowing they're not protecting a body, they're protecting the sacred spot. Where at first she was buried, you know, it seemed like she had died. They put her into this tomb. And then all the apostles were there when she died, except for one, St. Thomas. And St. Thomas gets the message that she's dying. For whatever reason, he delays, he gets there about a day or so late. Mary has already passed on and on to heaven. The apostles didn't know it yet at that time. St. Thomas begged St. Peter, please open it so I can gaze upon her one last time before the body corrupts. And so they opened the tomb for Thomas to look in. <laughs> they opened the tomb, and there was no body. And from that point, the Holy Ghost working in the church, they can understand. Mary had a favor similar to that of her son. Body and soul. She is assumed into heaven. Her body never corrupted in the grave, not even for a second. She passed, it's almost like a sleep, like call it dormition. She's like a sleep from death to eternal life, just that quick. And so she was assumed into heaven, body and soul. There she has a glorified body. At what point that took place after her death, I don't know. We'll ask God that in eternity. But we know that she is in heaven with her body. That's a dogma of our faith. Now, all those teachings regarding the Assumption, it's how we got to the point of the dogma, because Catholics believed all of that that I just said, almost from the very beginning of apostolic ages. The, the belief in Mary and her Assumption into Heaven has been that strong in the Church for all those years, but never as a dogma. But when Pope Pius XII was elected as the Pope, one of the first things he did, he wrote a letter to all the bishops of the world, and he asked them to ask the people in their diocese, all throughout the entire world, what would you think if we proclaimed Mary's assumption into heaven as a dogma? Is there any objection? Is there anything against it in any way? Because we think, no, we believe the Holy Ghost guides the church, and getting this voice from the people in this sense, 
It's not a democracy. He's not asking for a vote. But he wants the opinion from the worldwide church on this subject. The proclamation of the dogma of Mary's assumption into heaven. This was in 1946. Within a few months, he gets overwhelming positive response from every part of the world. Yes. Not only the bishops say we want it, the Latin word is placet, which pleases us that this would happen. But the people, hundreds, thousands, write into Rome saying, yes, yes, we want this proclaimed. Give honor and glory to God by giving honor to Mary in this way. And so on November 1st, 1950, the Pope proclaims this dogma as a dogma of faith. And he says, from henceforth, this is what we will believe as Catholics. No doubt, no opinion, anything else like that. Mary was truly assumed into heaven, body and soul. By the proclamation of the dogma, he gives more glory to Mary for all that she had done as the co-redemptrix, as the mother of the Redeemer, for all those things. She deserves more glory here on earth because of the great glory she has given by God in heaven. And so the proclamation of the dogma accomplishes that adds one more point of external glory we give to her on this earth by having no doubt, no worry about an opinion. Mary was assumed into heaven, body and whole. There she waits for us. And that gives us confidence in her intercession for us because her throne as queen is right next to her son as king in heaven. This is why you and I are called together on this Feast of the Assumption every year. That's why it's been made a holy day of obligation. That we can remember these points. Keep them in our minds and give honor to Mary. And through her, honor to Almighty God and to her Son. For the great things that were accomplished in her. He who was mighty had done great things to me. And holy is his name. I told you about the offertory verse already. The communion verse for today. Is all generations shall call me blessed, because he who is mighty has done great things for me. This proclamation of the dogma is among many things that fulfills that prophecy of Mary about what would come. Don't let the day just go by. It's the assumption had to come to church and go home, whatever. Honor Mary. Say some extra prayers in her honor before you leave church or at home tonight, whatever. Don't let this feast day pass until you've given the due honor to her. Because this is a dogma of our faith. And the more that we recognize that and pray to Mary with that confidence, that faith, in turn we receive the great graces from God. Because Mary is there ever interceding for us in all of our needs. That's what this dogma teaches us. And we pray that it will be a lesson that is always taught. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost.